chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Sanchez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor all the men and women who have courageously served this country and who continue to sacrifice in order to preserve the values and the freedoms of our great nation. In 1919, President Wilson spoke the following words as he commemorated, commemorated Armistice Day, better known to us all as Veterans Day, for the very first time. To us in America, the reflection of Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride in the heroism of those who died in this country's service and with gratitude for the victory. Now, of course, that was 1919, and it was a day when Americans reflected on the um, <clears throat> lives which were lost during World War I. World War I, the war to end all wars. However, then came World War II, America's engagement in Korea, and Congress voted to redesignate November 11th as Veterans Day in honor of all our veterans from all our wars. And today, of course, there are over 1.4 million men and women in active duty, many whom have completed multiple deployments in areas of the world where there is mass chaos, which is foreign to many of our young service members. Unfortunately, these service members bring this chaos home, both physically and mentally. Here are some staggering numbers from a recent report by the University of Southern California. Over two-thirds of today's veterans report difficulties adjusting to civilian life. Nearly eight in 10 service members leave the military without a job lined up. And in the area I represent in Orange County, nearly a quarter of the veterans with jobs are earning at or below the minimum, the poverty level. And these numbers, quite frankly, are very unacceptable. In 2014, an estimate of almost 50,000 veterans were living in shelter or in streets or in other places not dignant of the human population. This is 11% of the adult homeless population. And according to the numbers of studies, both male and female veterans are more likely to be homeless than their non-veteran counterparts. So how does that make sense? These men and women are brave, they're skilled, they're critical thinkers, they're dedicated, they're loyal, they love their country. So what's gone wrong? We must not only commit to figuring out how we're failing these young men and women, but once we do, we have to be held responsible for providing the necessary resources to help them succeed outside of the military. I understand this is a significant commitment, <clears throat> at a time of tight budgets and the changing nature of war, and that there's no one-size-fits-all for this solution. For California, for example, there are 1.8 million veterans. We make up 8% of the total U.S. veteran population. And according to the state of California, uh, California, California anticipates receiving an additional 30,000 discharge members of the armed services each year for the next several years. And we have to be ready. We have to be ready for those 30,000 veterans coming along, and also with the 1.8 million who already exist in California. <clears throat> As these members have served their country, so must we serve them. And according to the Veterans Administration, there are 22 suicides a day of our veterans. We must once again look at the causes of that staggering number. We've identified post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic brain injury, many triggers for suicide, et cetera, but we've got to do better. 20% of new recruits will also be women. 15% of the 14 million active duty forces are currently women. And over 280,000 women have served in Iraq and Afghanistan. We have to do different things for women veterans because it's not the same as the needs of the men's veterans. And as we all know, the VA must be looked at and we must make appropriate changes to deal with the backlog, to expedite disability claims, and to ensure that all veterans receive medical assistance in a timely manner. Lastly, we must protect what we fought hard for them, the education when they return back. We must ensure that military educational benefits do not go to waste. Next Wednesday, once again, we celebrate Veterans Day. And I urge my colleagues to work with me to ensure that we can be proud in the services and the help 
that we give our veterans, just as they have been proud to serve all of us. God bless, and I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, just a little over. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism. 